Okay. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay, I'm going to um, ask everybody to put your phones on, uh, or your, your mics on mute. All right, so that we can go ahead and get started here. Um, we're going to start off with a word of prayer. As we go, like I said before, we're, we're looking at a continuance. We're looking at a series called The Essence of Time. We're looking at end time prophecies that have not been fulfilled yet, that are going to be fulfilled in the near future, right before the coming of Christ and things that we need to be ready for and uh, this study will help us to know what movements are coming and what part we are called to play in those movements so let us have a word of prayer as we go ahead and get right into it dear heavenly father we want to thank you so much for your wonderful love and your mercy that you continue to extend to each and every one of us lord you have blessed us to uh, preserve our lives for us to even be here today so, dear Father, we just pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us as we get into this study. We pray, dear God, that you would help us to see the urgency, the essence of time. And, Lord, help us to recognize there's no time to waste at all. So, dear Father, if we have not been ready, we are not ready, or we have not gotten ready, uh, dear Father, help us to recognize that now is the time. We still have a few moments left. And we just pray, dear God, that each one of us would really take this seriously. So we pray that your Holy Spirit will convict our hearts. I pray that your Holy Spirit will use me as your mouthpiece, empty me of self, cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And Lord, glorify yourself in this message. For Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's put this over here. All right, so we're looking at the essence of time, part three. And so far we have been exploring the final movements that will take place just before the second coming of Christ. And this series has been instrumental in expressing the essence of time, as I said already. We learned that throughout the years there have been things taking place in preparation for the attempt of Satan to take over this planet and all those living in it and we know that's called the new world order or the ten kings coming together that we see in Revelation chapter 17 so him and his angels have been manifesting themselves as dead loved ones we see that this is one part of the uh, deceptions of Satan he has been manifesting himself all over the planet uh, pretending to be uh, the, the dead loved ones of many individuals People have been um, visited, I would say, visited by beings whom they would have perceived to have been relatives that might have passed away, or whatever the case may be. But we know that the Bible teaches us that the dead, once they're dead, they know nothing, they're sleeping, they're not floating around, but spiritualism has been spreading throughout the world for many many years probably for centuries for many years matter of fact since the uh, the time of Saul even before that so Satan has been doing this in an increasing manner across the globe and he's been doing strategic things um, to, uh, in order to deceive the masses and unite them in a common belief as I mentioned just now spiritualism you have the, uh, the Catholics and the most of the Christian world believe that once you die, you don't really die. You go into another uh, realm or you, you just leave your body. So this is a common uh, belief all over the world. And most people have been deceived because of it. And so what, that, what this does is it, it causes people to turn away from the Bible. Because the Bible doesn't teach these things it teaches that when the soul the soul that sinneth shall die the first lie of the uh, immortality of the soul was given to Eve when he said thou shalt not surely die that same lie has been perpetuated throughout the centuries and in this time we're gonna see a unification of the supposed Protestant world 
the papal church and they're going to unite because they have one common denominator and that is spiritualism most people have been turned from the plain truths of the Bible and to the lie that the serpent told to the first parents of humanity again I'm going to ask you to turn your uh, mics on mute okay um, so that there's no distractions in this presentation he has turned the world against God's truths and his holy moral law as well we learned that he has united most of the world in a counterfeit system of religion so as to divert man's worship from God unto himself. The false Sabbath also, Sunday worship, is gaining acceptance. We saw that last week as the Lord's Day. While the true system of worship given to man at creation has almost wholly been lost sight of. Last week we learned that Satan's deceptions are so great that even many who now profess to keep God's true system of worship will soon join the ranks of the opposition. Soon to obey God rather than man will be looked upon as rebellion. Soon all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And there will be a low point before the high. So we're going to look at several things. We're going to see that there's a couple of low spots that are going to be um, that will come upon God's people in the experience that we're going to go through in the near future. So I'm going to read a few quotations. One of them is from Great Controversy, page 608, paragraph 3. This is a low point that God's people are going to reach in the near future. Notice what it says here. Some overwhelmed with consternation will be ready to exclaim, had we foreseen the consequences of our words, we would have held our peace. They are hedged in with difficulties. Satan assails them with fierce temptations. The work which they have undertaken seems far beyond their ability to accomplish. They are threatened with destruction. The enthusiasm which animated them is gone. Yet they cannot turn back. Notice here, there's a low point. God's people are going to go through a low point as they stand up for God's truth and they start going through persecution. They're going to be hedged in with so many difficulties. And they're going to be assailed by Satan with fierce temptations. So this is coming soon. If it's not happen to, happening to us now, it's going to happen. And the good news here is that even though the enthusiasm that animated God's people would be gone, in their mind, they're fixed. They said, we cannot turn back. Praise the Lord. What God's people begin to go through is something that has been common to all of God's faithful since the beginning of time, but it's going to increase to a time that has never been such a time as, as what's going to be in the future. But what they start to go through in the beginning, it's pretty common. In Ecclesiastes 1.9, it says, The thing that has been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. But we are told that there's going to be a time of trouble such as has never been. So we're going to get, it's going to increase as we get into this battle between good and evil and the mark of the beast crisis as we get going pretty soon in this conflict. Now in Psalm 143, paragraph 3 and 4, the Bible says, For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has smitten my life down to the ground. He has made me to dwell in darkness as those that have been long dead. Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is desolate. This is the type of mindset that God's people will be going through. They were gonna, they're going to be getting tempted and tempted to probably um, feel a little bit discouraged. But they're going to hold their ground. They're going to stand firm. So brethren... We, if we're going to be part of those people, we need to be preparing ourselves now to stand firm. If we can't stand firm in the little trials that we're going through today, we're not going to be able to stand firm when these bigger trials begin to come. So right now is the testing time. Right now is the, the learning time. It's the preparation time. It's the training time. This is the little bit. Of, and People think that we're going through a storm right now, but this is really a calm before the storm. It's starting to become a storm 
little by little, but this is, we haven't seen anything yet. Remember, Satan's work, the work that he's doing right now in the world, what we see going on in the world, all of this chaos and pestilence and famines and plagues, all these things, these are little steps going up the ladder and things are just going to get worse and they're going to get bigger. They're going to increase and they're going to get harder. But the Bible says in Matthew 5 and verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's one thing to be persecuted because you did something wrong. I just heard that in America now, they have reinstituted the federal um, death decree. So they are, they are um, putting people that were on death row for many, many years, uh, and they are actually executing them. A person was just executed this morning, uh, around 7 something this morning. He died at 8 something this morning. And that was the first uh, execution in 17 years, federal execution in 17 years. So we, we know that persecution is going to intensify. And we know that many of us might be martyred. But blessed are they. See, the man who might have been uh, executed this morning, he might have been executed because of crimes that he was well, actually a triple murder but there's one thing to be persecuted because you committed a crime that's not a blessing there's no blessing in that the blessing is to be persecuted for righteousness sake not for unrighteousness sake there's a big difference we want to receive the blessings of God so we want to be if, if we're going to be persecuted let it be for righteousness sake let us be living in Christ so that when persecution comes, we know that it's nothing that we did wrong. There's our, conscious, our conscience will be clean. For it says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Praise God. Now, when we begin to go through these trials, brothers and sisters, we need to remember one thing. Proverbs 18.10 says this, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and is safe. There's safety in, notice here, it says the name of the Lord. Now, name is synonymous with character. Name is the same as um, glory. The glory of the Lord, the name of the Lord, the character of the Lord, the righteousness of God. So being clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ would give us the name of the Lord because we would have the character of Christ. It would be Christ living within us in our mind. We would have the name of the Lord written in our mind, in our hearts. So the name of the Lord is a strong tower. To be in Christ is to be in a safe place, brothers and sisters. There is no safety anywhere else. People are building bunkers. People are doing all kind of things, you know, these bunker builders, whether they, they call them, um, uh, these preppers, doomsday preppers, they call them. Rich people, some rich people think they, they're going to be able to escape the uh, things that are going to be coming on the earth um, because they're building some bunkers or they think they they got some old missile silos that they turn into uh, apartments or condominiums under the ground. Even the government has uh, some cities underground, in, under mountains. But they have no understanding of what uh, this world, the chaos that this world's in. When Adam sinned, the whole world went into chaos. Therefore, there's the only reason why it's being held together is because there's angels proactively working continuously to restrain the forces of nature from self-destructing. There's nowhere on, on the planet that's safe. No matter how deep you go into the earth and how big of a bunker and how deep the concrete is, it makes no difference. But these people, they don't understand that. That's why they need people like us, brethren, to warn them and let them know their only safety is in Jesus Christ. When the angels are commanded to let loose, all the earth is going to break apart. All the concrete, everything that they've built is going to break apart. They might even be buried in their uh, underground bunkers because they thought it was a safe haven and it would become their tomb. But God wants to save them and He needs people like us to give them the truth 
that there is no safety in that. So the righteous will run into the, the Lord. They would run in, they, their safety would be in Christ, in having His character. That's where the safety is. So then, feeling their utter helplessness, the people of God flee to the Mighty One for strength. We're told in great controversy. They remember that the words which they have spoken were not theirs, but His who bade them give the warning. God put the truth into their hearts, and they could not forbear to proclaim it. So God's people, although they go through all these trials, God's people, those true people who have not failed to prepare, will be prepared to stand firm at this time. When God enters the soul, brethren, the soul cannot contain such goodness without sharing it with others. I like what uh, Brother Joel said the other day, that when the truth comes in, if we didn't have a mouth to proclaim it, we would explode. Because it's so powerful. The Word of God is so powerful that we would explode if it, we wouldn't release it uh, out of our mouth. Romans 10 and verse 15 says, As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. This doesn't mean that we're going to be preaching peace, peace and safety. Because we know there's not going to be any peace and safety. That's not what this is saying. It's saying the gospel of peace. In other words, the gospel is what brings peace. When you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, it automatically brings peace with it into the soul that receives it. This is what it means. We're not going to be preaching smooth things. We're not going to be preaching things that people make, make them feel comfortable in their sins. This is not the work that God has called us to do. He's called us to do a work of showing the house of Israel their sins, actually. Many people might not like us because we're going to be preaching the truth and exposing sin for what it is. And because some people are clinging on to sin, they're going to, be, they're going to become our greatest opposers. They're going to be our greatest backstabbers and those that really hate us and are going to determine to turn against us. And we want to pray that God opens their eyes before it's too late. In Isaiah chapter 40 verse 9, the Bible says, O Zion, that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. This is the message. Why? Because the name of Christ will be written in the forehead. In other words, we would have his character. So the greatest sermon that's ever going to be preached is our life reflecting the character of Christ and us only speaking that which the Holy Spirit puts in our mouths, which are not going to be smooth things. So many people are not going to like it. But those who love the Lord and those who really are humble and those who recognize they need a Savior will take heed. They will love the words that come out because they come from the Holy Spirit. Now, Great Controversy 609, paragraph 1 says, The same trials have been experienced by men of God in ages past. Wycliffe, Huss, Luther, Tyndale, Baxter, Wesley. They all urged that all doctrines be brought to the test of the Bible and declared that they would renounce everything which it condemned. Against these men, persecution raged with relentless fury, yet they ceased not to declare the truth. Praise God. Some of these men were executed, burned at the stake. And in the case of like Huss, burnt at the stake, but when he was at the stake, he was singing hymns to God while he was burning. He had a supernatural power manifested upon him that people saw, and when people saw that, they were converted. Many people saw the peace that the gospel brought to Huss, even in the midst of the fiery trial, literally, he was burning at the stake, and people were converted. They saw the power of God in this man. And they said, I want that power. That was a crowning act of ministry in his case. Now, many of these forefathers spoke as the faithful will speak and as David spoke, which was recorded in Psalm 145, 21, where he said, My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name 
forever and ever. Wow. You know, when you think about these things, and these men would have loved to be living in the times that we're living in today. They would have loved to be here, to, to go through the final crisis and to be able to vindicate God's holy name. This is the opportunity that each and every one of us have today. The question is, will we take that opportunity? Will we, will, will we, will we magnify Jesus Christ? Will we vindicate His holy name and defend Him? against all odds. One thing that will work to bring an end to the great controversy is the development of some special truth. This is something that people need to understand. There is a special truth that will be developed. This will help to bring an end to the great controversy. Many have neglected this special truth for it has already fallen upon the receptive ones and will be a powerful weapon against the forces of darkness. There are conditions though that need to be met in order for us to be useful for God's cause and we are going to see that in Isaiah 58 verses 9 to 12. The Bible says this, If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul then shall thy light rise in obscurity you got to listen to this very carefully and thy darkness be as the noonday and the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach. The restorer of paths to dwell in. Notice that it says, If we take away from the midst of us the yoke, what yoke? The yoke of bondage. And putting forth of the finger, in other words, pointing at others instead of ourselves, and speaking vanity, foolishness, maybe gossiping, filled with sin and all, ma all manner of evil surmising. And if we allow the Lord to transform us, the darkness that we were in will be as the noonday. What does the noonday represent? The full glory of the sun. That means we'll reach the point where we would receive the full light that we need to be able to be part of the third angel's message movement, the loud cry, uh, um, the third angel, the fourth angel actually of Revelation 18, loud cry movement, but, but it all joins in with the third angel. So we would be part of the third angel's movement, the loud cry messengers at the end of time. But we have to allow God in our hearts so that He can do the work that He wants to do, and that is to cleanse our hearts. So if we cooperate, cooperate with God and accept His grace, we will be watered. We will increase in knowledge. Our growth will be so effectual that our darkness will be turned into the noonday. We will receive the capacity of knowing God at the highest level attainable to man. For those that do not let God into their hearts, it will not be so. Now, there's one person here saying they cannot hear. I uh, just want to make sure everybody else can hear me. Is that... Can somebody uh, verify that you can hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, so it must be that person's uh, computer. All right. So we're going to move on. Notice here in Isaiah 59, we're going to look at those that do not let God into their hearts. This is a sad, sad declaration. And it's found in Isaiah 59, verses 3 to 10. We want to be those that turn to God and allow the darkness to turn to noonday. But here we're going to see those that choose the opposite. Notice here, Isaiah 59, 3-10. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue has muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity, and speak lies, they conceive mischief 
and bring forth iniquity. They hatch cockatrice eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. Their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Notice who made them crooked paths. They made their own crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. Notice they will not know peace at all because they don't have rest. They don't have the Sabbath rest principle uh, in, uh, implanted in them. Therefore is judgment far from us, neither does justice, justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. Notice, when the noonday is shining, when the brightest truth has been given to God's people, for them it will be night. We are in a desolate, desolate places as dead men. Wow. These are solemn words, my brothers and sisters. Let us not close off our own eyes because we allow the deceptions of indulgence or pride to sweep us away. We have been offered eternity, brothers and sisters. Let us not believe that a bowl of soup is better. If we open our eyes to allow the Savior to shine, we will get glimpses of Him that will reveal a type of goodness that we could have never imagined. You know, Esau was the son that was in line for the birthright. He was going to receive the inheritance of his father. And his father was a wealthy man. And he came from a trip. And his other brother, who was trying to, you know, kind of trick him into giving up his birthright, had a nice bowl of, uh, one of probably his favorite bowls of soup cooking. And it smelled so good. It was a lentil soup or something like that. And the brother came to him and said, listen, let me get a bowl of that soup. And um, Jacob told him, he says, um, well, give me your birthright, you know. Make an oath that you, you, you would give me your trade in your birthright for this bowl of soup. And Esau, I don't know what he was thinking, but he did. He made an oath to his brother to give up his birthright for a bowl of soup. Eventually he did lose his birthright and he enjoyed his bowl of soup. So he, he, you know, this is the kind of thing that uh, sin does to us. Sin makes us, it, it kind of enslaves us. And it kind of binds us in chains. And sometimes it might even smell good and taste good and look good. Sin is always going to be enticing to the carnal nature. But Christ is offering us a new nature, a divine nature. A nature that no longer looks at sin as attractive. No longer does it smell good to uh, the person who has the divine nature of God. Sin now smells rotten. Sin tastes uh, disgusting. It looks horrific. Put, you see, Jesus promised in the beginning. He promised that he was going to put enmity between the woman and the serpent. When we give our hearts to God, you see, many of us think that we can't give our hearts to God because we're trapped. We're stuck in sin. It's so good. We're so attracted to it. We're so connected to it. It's, it's got us locked in like in, in, in some type of uh, trance. All we need to do is open the door and say, Jesus, come in and save me. Jesus, come in. Save me. Jesus brings in a new nature. He rewires the mind. He puts a different program inside so that we don't have to worry about trying to conquer sin uh, on our own accord, in other words. You know, 
The carnal mind, it says, is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can it be. So we are going to be stuck until Jesus comes in. When we allow Jesus in, he gives us now a different program. That now that bowl of soup doesn't look good, doesn't taste good, doesn't smell good anymore. Now the things of the Lord look good. The things of God smell good. Those are the things that taste good. Those are the things that we're now drawn to and attracted to. And it's a supernatural power, brothers and sisters. So don't think that people that are Christian and that they look like they're holy roly and they're living a perfect life, that they're doing it on their own power. No human power can do that. There's no human power that can obey God. It is the power of God that comes into the human so that he can obey God. God rewires the mind. So don't be fooled into believing that you have to be stuck in sin forever. Because you don't. All you have to do is allow God in and He changes our desires. Those of us that claim to be the remnant people of God. Now, first of all, I want to go to Revelation 18.1 before I make that comment. Because, um, you know, we don't want to close our eyes, as I said before, and allow the deceptions or indulgence of pride and, 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 and uh, sin sweep us away. We have been offered eternity, and so let us grab a hold of it. And the Bible gives us a clue as to God's goodness and the special message that will be coming in, coming into the, uh, the work of God and to His gospel. Notice here in Revelation 18 verse 1, it says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with His glory. This is the this is actually if you go back to Revelation chapter 14, which is the third angel's message, it's the three angels of Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12. Those are the first, second, and third angels. Those we call the third angel's message. But here we see a fourth. Revelation 18:1 is a fourth angel. And it says, This one comes down from heaven having great power. Great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory now those of us that claim to be the remnant people of God have come to understand somewhat of the three angels messages of Revelation 14 6 to 12 but many amongst us have no clear understanding of the special truth found in an investigation of the fourth angel of Revelation 18 and it's essential for us to understand this if we're going to be part of the loud cry movement because this angel must join the three of Revelation 14 of course angel here rep means movements of God's people so it means that God's people will be, re will be receiving light as if the sun was at noonday and that is what we receive in Revelation 18 and as we continue to go on he'll continue to unfold more truth to us now Inspiration tells us in, what uh, quotation is this? Great Controversy 609 paragraph 1. It says, Different periods in the history of the church have each been marked by the development of some special truth adapted to the necessities of God's people at that time. Every new truth. Now some people say there's no new truth. Well, truth is not really new, but the, the term new truth is used in the spirit of prophecy because it's new to us when we get to understand something that we never understood before that is new truth to us but truth is eternal and truth is Christ Christ is not new he's from he's the ancient you know he's from way back just like the ancient of days he's also ancient of days as well he's from eternity past and so truth is truth right but truth unfolds to us and it be so to us we see it as new truth Notice here, every new truth has made its way against hatred and opposition. Those who were blessed with its light were tempted and tried. The Lord gives a special truth for the people in an emergency. Are we headed towards an emergency, brothers and sisters? Yes, we are. This is going to be the greatest emergency in the history of humanity. It is actually the, the, the final climax of the battle between good and evil and the great controversy. So we are headed for an emergency and the Lord gives a special truth for His people in an emergency. 
Who dare refuse to publish it? This is a question. It's a rhetorical question. It's, 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 a, it's in other words, it's saying none of us, none of us should dare to uh, not publish it, right? Who dare refuse to publish it? Right? We better not dare to refuse to publish it because if we have God in us, we will not refuse to publish it, right? He commands His servants to present the last invitation of mercy to the world. They cannot remain silent except at the peril of their souls. Christ's ambassadors have nothing to do with consequences. I'll read that again. Christ's ambassadors have nothing to do with consequences. They must perform their duty and leave results with God. And this is not in the context of we must do this or we must do that. That's not what it's saying. That's not the context. The context is in our own mind we must stand for God. We will stand for God. If we have the Lord in us and the Spirit of God with us, we will have no fear of consequences. We learned that last week, by the way. But there comes a second low point. We saw there was a first low point, but then there's a second low point. So God's people are going to be going through high and low points in their experience as we get closer to the coming of Christ and as persecution intensifies. I'm going to read this quotation from Great Controversy, page 610, paragraph 1. Remember, we're looking at the final movements. We're looking at what is going to be happening in the world and in regard to God's people. God shows everything to His people before it happens. Because in Amos 3.7, He says, I, 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 I reveal my secrets to my servants, the prophets. And so God gave us the spirit of prophecy so that we can know exactly what's going to happen with us and in the world right before the coming of Christ. There's going to be a high, there's going to be a low, there's going to be another high, and then a second low point. Notice here, Great Controversy 610, paragraph 1. As the opposition rises to a fiercer height, the servants of God are again perplexed. Nothing wrong with being perplexed, because that's part of human weakness, human nature. Right? We're still human, even like Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ was at uh, Gethsemane, He was going through a crisis. He didn't disobey. He wasn't disobedient. He didn't uh, fail in any way. But you can see, when you read about His experience, you can see how the, how, uh, the human humanity, the weak, human weaknesses can affect us in our experiences, can bring us into low points, high points, low points. So that's going to happen with us. It's going to be almost like a little roller coaster ride uh, in our experience as we persecution continues to intensify. So as the opposition rises to a fiercer height, the servants of God are again perplexed, for it seems to them that they have brought the crisis. It's going to seem to us that we have brought the crisis. That's exactly what the world will be saying. The world will be saying that all the calamities, all the issues of the world are happening because of us. But that might not be the same exact thing we're thinking. God's people will be thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't have been so forefront, you know, so, 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 so strong about the issues and maybe I wouldn't be suffering so much that I'm suffering now. That's the context in which they would be thinking. They know they didn't bring the hurricanes and tornadoes and calamities. They don't think that. They don't think what the world thinks of us. They don't believe the world's lies. But in their mind, they're, they're perplexed and they're thinking, wow, maybe I should have kind of not been so strong or something. You know, this is the kind of thoughts that come to their mind. And we're going to see that as we continue. But conscience and the word of God assure them that their course, that their course is right. Notice, conscience and the word of God. Very important. And how is it that the word of God, because we're going to know the word of God. We might be in places where we don't have the Bible anymore. We might be in prisons. We, who knows? We, we don't know what's going to happen when the, 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 the opposition intensifies. We don't know where we're going to be. We might not have the written word available. But we will have it here if we would have studied and prepared. God's people are, going, are to prepare today so that they can have the word stored here. Notice that conscience is clean. They know they haven't done anything wrong. Their conscience is clean. That means the Holy Spirit is, 
is allowing them to realize that they have done nothing wrong, that they're in line with God. It's when we are not in line with God that our conscience becomes defiled. Because the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, right? When we fall off on the wrong course or we're going in the wrong road or we're making a bad decision, the Holy Spirit convicts us. This is how we know we're going the wrong way. But notice, at this time, God's people, their conscience lines up with the Word of God. It says the conscience and the Word of God assures them that their course is right. And although the trials continue, they are strengthened to bear them. Praise God. The contest grows closer and sharper, but their faith and courage rise with the emergency. Notice that even though they go into this perplexity, they gain strength. They have peace. Their conscience is clean. The word validates that they're in the right spot. The contest grows closer and sharper, but their faith and courage rise with the emergency. Their testimony is, we dare not tamper with God's word. Dividing, uh, dividing His holy law. Calling one portion essential and another non-essential to gain the favor of the world. They won't do that. The Lord whom we serve is able to deliver us. The same thing that the three Hebrew boys told King Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord whom we serve is able to deliver us. Christ has conquered the powers of earth. And shall we be afraid of a world already conquered? These are the thoughts that come to their mind. And guess who's putting those thoughts in their mind? The holy angels. The holy angels who have legal authority over them will be giving them reinforcements. These are the weapons of our warfare, brethren. Holy impressions from God to strengthen us to go through whatever storm comes our way. Praise God. Notice that opposition comes in waves. But conscience and the Word of God assure us that our course is right. God's people would have learned how to reconcile seemingly contradictory scriptures for they dare not tamper with God's word, dividing His holy law, they're calling one portion essential and another non-essential. God's people will know that this is describing in a primary way the holy law, but it has to also apply to the rest of the scriptures as well. For it deals with the last invitation of mercy to the world. And what is that? It has to do with the glory that will fill the earth at the sound of the fourth angel of Revelation 18. Important for us to understand as we're going into this final crisis, brethren. Some people think it's going to get better after this COVID-19 and this uh, um, BLM movements and all these uh, protests. But it's, brethren, it's not going to get any better. These are just steps upon steps upon steps of the closing movements of Satan. He's starting to panic. I think he's starting to get worried. Little by little, he's going to start getting worried more and more because God's truth is filling the earth. The knowledge of His glory is filling the earth. People are starting to understand God in a clear way so that they can really love Him and trust Him. And that's going to make him panic. Notice here. Waves of persecution. So we're going to look at this. The spirit of prophecy describes this last message of mercy, by the way. So we're going to look at that. Christ Object Lessons, page 415, paragraph 5. It says, the last rays. Now notice, last rays means last, right? So that means there's nothing. There's going to be always, uh, you know, truth. But these are the last rays to close up the final work here on planet Earth. So that we can go to heaven. And in heaven, we're going to keep getting more rays of light. Of course, because truth is eternal. And we might even get more light even as we go, you know, as we, we continue, because God will never stop giving us uh, rays of light. But this is one of the last rays of light that is essential for God's people to be prepared for the final crisis. That's why it says the last rays of merciful light. Notice here, the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world, is a revelation of His, God's character of love. Think about that for a minute. Many people think they know that God is love. The, most of the world, most of the, the evangelical world. The papal system, they claim to believe that God is love. 
almost every Christian in the world believes that God is love. So why would this be the last rays of merciful light? Could it be that people have misunderstood the depth of God's love? I would say so. People have not understood God's love. They look at God's love as human love. They look at God's behavior as human behavior. They have made the godly as, uh, as, as equal or equivalent to the creature. But God has given us now merciful light, this message of God's love, the character of love, so that we can, the veil can be removed from our eyes and we can see God in His true light today. Notice here, the children of God are to manifest His glory in their own life and character. They are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. So, once we understand this fourth angel's message, the message of His character of love in the deepest sense, then it will be, we, it will be able to be manifested in us. If we don't know the depth of God's love in reality, and we have this human ideology of God's love, which is equivalent to man's love, then that's the only level of which we will be able to, be, uh, to, to rise up in character development. But when we understand God's true love and his, the depth of His character, we will be able to rise up to that level of character development. Because by beholding, we will become changed into that same image. So the waves of persecution will not stop, brothers and sisters. Notice here in Great Controversy 610, paragraph 2. Persecution in its varied forms is the development of a principle which will exist as long as Satan exists and Christianity has vital power. No man can serve God without enlisting against himself the opposition of the hosts of darkness. Evil angels will assail him. Alarmed that his influence is taking the prey from their hands, evil men rebuked by his example will unite with them in seeking to separate him from God by alluring temptations. When these do not succeed, then a compelling power is employed to force the conscience. Notice that this persecution has a lot to do with the internal battle of the mind. Notice, it's not coming at us at this time with, with weapons. And this is before the death decree. This is, this, these are superior battles, brethren. And we win these battles, the death decree will be nothing. These are really the serious battles here. Notice that it is in the mind. Okay? Darkness in the mind. Evil angels will assail us. Where? In the mind. Um, evil men will unite with the evil angels in seeking to separate us from God by what? Alluring temptations. What are they going to do? They're going to try to offer us. They're going to try to bribe us to uh, recant or reject God's law of love. But thank God for He has instituted a safeguard for his tempted and tried people. He has angels standing on the four corners of the earth, brethren, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree, till they have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. Revelation 7, verses 1 and 3. We have so much to give thanks to God for it, in regard to the wonderful work that his restraining angels are doing. They will be the ones to restrain. They will give us. They will restrain the carnal nature in our in our minds, so that the divine nature will be supreme. The, the divine nature will be untouchable. It will be able to withstand all of the wiles of the devil and all the evil men who try to entice us. But we have to be secure in Christ today. We have. This is the preparation time now. We think things are going to get better. We're going to have a nice hunky-dory time on this earth. We have something coming. God is warning us, brothers and sisters. And these warnings are, are to not to be taken lightly. Because uh, 
soon we might not be hearing any more warnings. Soon we'll be in the middle of the, it's either we're going to be uh, for God or against God. And if we haven't taken heed and really put ourselves into God's word and allow Jesus Christ into our hearts, we're, we, we might not be able to get ready at that time. Great Controversy 610 paragraph 3 says this, So long as Jesus remains man's intercessor in the sanctuary above, the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is felt by rulers and people. He will not only be restraining our carnal nature, He will also restrain those around us because he has, he's, he has legal authority over us. Notice here. So long as Jesus remains man's intercessor in the sanctuary above, the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is felt by rulers and people. It still controls to some extent the laws of the land. Were it not for these laws, the condition of the world would be much worse than it is now. While many of our rulers are active agents of Satan, God also has his agents among the leading men of the nation. Praise God. There's people in the government that God has there for a time and a season. The enemy moves upon his servants to propose measures that would greatly impede the work of God. But notice, statesmen who fear the Lord are influenced by holy angels to oppose such propositions with unswervable arguments. Thus, a few men will hold in check a powerful current of evil. The opposition of the enemies of truth will be restrained that the third angel's message may do its work. When the final warning shall be given, it will arrest the attention of these leading men through whom the Lord is now working. And some of them will accept it and will stand with the people of God through the time of trouble. Praise God. Wow. What we see here, brothers and sisters, in Revelation chapter 7, Verses 1 to is, is actually Revelation chapter 7, 1 to 3 in action. That's what we read about just now. These are the angels working. They're working to restrain. They're using men who fear the Lord in places of authority to restrain the powers that be. For what? The restraining angel will work to hold and check the power of the powerful current of evil. And this restraint will be in effect until the fourth angel does the work that it was intended to do and that is what to seal all those that respond to the loud cry trumpet call of God praise God the fourth angel great controversy 611 paragraph 1 who unites in the proclamation of the third angels message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory a work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. The Advent movement of 1840-44 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every missionary station in the world. And in some countries, there was the greatest religious interest which has been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But notice here, these are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel. The last warning of the third angel will be given when the fourth angel unites with the third. We read that in the beginning of this quotation. It said, the fourth angel, or the angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with God's glory. So brethren, this is a special truth. This is a special this is a new truth for some people but nonetheless it is an essential truth in order for us to be able to close the work and notice that the angels will restrain the powers that be so that the work could be finished so what does that tell us the work of God will be finished so you're seeing what's happening now there's a restraint taking place right now or else it would be a much worse than what it is now. Right now, we have the ability to use technology. You see, the devil tried to shut us all out of the churches, right? He tried to shut all the churches down. But you know what? Through this medium, we're having more people's attending because people can attend from all over the world, these messages. So, 
the message of the third angel is going forth to the ends of the earth. God has made a way. He's protecting these mediums. He's protecting these ways for us to continue to spread the gospel till the work is done. Once the work is done, then he can, he can tell the angels to release the restraints. During the persecution, brethren, and before the closure of probation, and before the seven last plagues, there will be a most glorious manifestation of the glory of God that will grant the final work a power that has never been seen before. In Acts chapter 2, verses 17 and 21, and Great Controversy, page 611, paragraph 2, we're told, the work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. As the former rain was given in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the opening of the gospel to cause the upspringing of the precious seed, so the, so the latter rain will be given at its close for the ripening of the harvest. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, His going forth is prepared as the morning, and He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. Hosea chapter 6 verse 3. Be, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for He has given you the former rain moderately, and He will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain. Joel 2.23 In the last days, saith God, I will pour out my, of my Spirit upon all flesh, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? saved from their sins glory be to God you see brethren sins sting of death will no longer have power over the children of God they would have conquered sin to be part of the third angels movement message messengers God's people will conquer sin this is the conquering time as I said before if sin has us in bondage and sin has us as uh, entranced. Now is the time to just open the door and say, God, save me. I need you. Cleanse me. He will be, do the work to remove the desires of those things. We just need to open a door. We just have to believe and trust and just open the door. It's not that we, ha we don't have to try to cleanse our own hearts, brethren. We don't have to try to remove every single desire and wickedness out of our hearts. It doesn't work that way. We can't do that. It's impossible. We have to receive Christ first. We have to open the door of our heart and say, Come in. Lord, save me. We need to cry out to Him. Save me. And He will remove the desire of sin from us, brethren. And we will be victorious. We will be. We just have to let Him in. Notice here. And I'm closing now. The great work of the gospel. Um is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than it marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain at its close. Here are the times of refreshing to which the Apostle Peter looked forward when he said, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and He shall send Jesus. Acts chapter 3, 19 and 20, in Great Controversy 611, paragraph 3. Notice that the prophecies which were fulfilled at Pentecost are again to be fulfilled in our time. Notice here in uh, Great Controversy 6.12, paragraph 1. Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Satan cannot stop it. No matter what Satan tries to do, he will not be able to stop the loud cry movement. Miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed. And signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men, found in Revelation 13, 13. 
Thus the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. People will have to take their stand. You see, if we've been deceived by sin and we've been indulging in sin and just, if we allow sin to continue in our life and we don't receive the invitation from Jesus Christ to just let Him in the door so He can do, start doing His cleaning. When the miracles of Satan begin to happen, we will be deceived and we will go along with Satan's deceptions. Satan will be doing miracles, but God's people will also be doing miracles. But we will be looking at Satan's miracles as, as if they were genuine. And we will be looking at the miracles that God's people are doing. And we would not be able to tell that they are genuine. We would, be able to, we would think that they would be the ones that be deceptive. Because we were going to be starting looking at what is good as evil and what is evil as good. Satan does something to reverse our common sense. We have no common sense. We won't see what's, what's white or what's black, what's right, what's, you know what I'm saying? We won't, we won't see it. We will only see the darkness. The darkness will enshroud our minds and deceive us. Now, not everybody will be deceived because we know some people will also receive the mark of the beast on their, for, on their hands. So it doesn't really apply to everybody, but it could happen to, to the majority of us if we are not careful. Either way, we'll be in a big problem because even if we receive the mark of the beast on our hand, that's still being deceived to a certain degree. Because we did not accept freedom. Why wouldn't we accept freedom if we, were, if we weren't deceived that it wasn't really accessible to us? Notice in great controversy. So, so I want to say this. The, there will be the, the, this will be, brethren, the final showdown between truth and error. The whole world will be forced to take a stand on one side or the other. No one will be able to choose a middle ground. Some people might be in the valley of decision today. But that valley will be wiped away. There will be no more valley of decision. There's going to come a time when everyone's going to make a decision. And we're going to look at that as we continue in this series. We're going to see there's going to be a time when there is going to be no, no, no more valley of decision. There will be no middle ground. The message of the fourth angel will unite with the third and power on a grand scale will be granted to the servants of the Most High to work miracles. This power is not something new to God's faithful children, but because of the rapid sifting, they will be noticeably high, highlighted as never before. Another factor is that because of their advancement in character development, which will be the highest ever reached by men, the power accessible to them will likewise be the highest ever reached. Now, in Great Controversy 612, paragraph 2, in closing, notice here, this is my final quotation, it says, the message will be carried not so much by argument as by the deep conviction of the Spirit of God. We won't be debating. It will be the Spirit of God in us that will be convincing to the populations. The arguments have been presented. The seed has been sown. And now it will spring up and bear fruit. The publications distributed by missionary workers have exerted their influence. Yet many whose minds were impressed have been prevented from fully comprehending the truth or from yielding obedience. Now, the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clearness and the honest children of God sever the bands which have held them. Family connections, church relations are powerless to stay them now. Truth is more precious than all besides. And notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. We're going to see some serious conversions. Thousands by the thousands. People that are right now in the Valley of Decision. People that are right now uh, in a place where they don't really comprehend the truth as you know, God wants them to. It's going to be very, made very clear as the persecution, these waves of persecution come in. What these waves of persecution do is actually help the gospel to become so clear in the mind of those that, in which it was obscure that thousands are going to be converted just before the mark of the beast. Thousands, brethren. The gospel work will finish its work. It will do its work and it will bring every person who really loves the Lord into the truth and out of Babylon. 
as the great controversy goes into its final showdown, which is coming soon. It's coming soon, brothers and sisters. The showdown is coming. That's why we're looking at this series called The Essence of Time. Time is of the essence. Because the showdown is coming. As the great controversy goes into its final showdown, the truth will be seen in its clearness. Honest men, women, and children will sever the bands that kept them from taking their stand. Family connections won't stop them now. Church relations, they won't be thinking as the church is the ship. They're going to see Jesus is the ship. And they're going to jump the, fault, the, the, the ship that's sinking and they're going to jump into the real ship, Jesus Christ. Family connections, church relations are powerless to stay them now. Ministers used to threaten them and say, if you leave the church, you're going to be lost. And they kind of believed it. At this time, they will no longer believe it. They will realize that that's not the truth. The truth is Christ is the way. He's the truth. He is the life. Truth is more precious than all besides. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, the large, a large number will take their stand upon the Lord's side. Today, many are facing these issues all around the world. Many are being martyred for their faith today. But soon, we will find ourselves in the midst of the showdown. God is calling us today. He's calling us to prepare for the storm. He wants us to prepare for the storm by surrendering all to Jesus now. For if we wait, brothers and sisters, until the showdown, it may be too late for those who neglected the opportunities given today I'm going to pray as I close we'll have a one more song but I'm going to close this because I'm streaming and um, we're going to have, ask somebody to pray I'm going to ask whoever's impressed to pray to just unmute yourself after this song and begin to close this out in prayer let us pray dear Heavenly Father I want to thank you so much for revealing to us some of the final movements to take place shortly. Lord, you just continue to call us and call us and call us and give us an invitation, an invitation, and an invitation. Many of us continue to neglect the invitation. Many of us continue to refuse to heed the call. Lord, have mercy on all those that are listening to this message today. That your Holy Spirit will will convict them to such a degree that they will procrastinate no longer. Help us that, dear Father, all of us will give up everything that we have so that we can be perfected by your Holy Spirit. We want the name of the Lord written on our hearts so that we can have His character. We want to know you, Lord. So we pray that you reveal yourself to us. As Moses prayed, show me your glory. Dear Father, we too pray, show us your glory that we may be changed into the same glory. Dear Father, we thank you. I pray for everyone that is uh, hearing this message or will hear it in the future. That, dear Father, that you will touch their hearts, that none will be lost, but everyone will be saved in your kingdom. We know, dear Father, this is coming soon, and we see that the movements are happening now. So, dear Father, help us to, be, to really feel the urgency, the essence of time, and so that we will not waste any more of it. Dear Father, we thank you. We praise you. Bless us as we continue on in the rest of our week. We pray that we will meditate on these things. That we will continue to receive power from up on high. So that we can help others to also, uh, others that may be weak. That we may be able to help them to be strong. Dear Father, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify your holy name. We thank you for revealing these things to us. And we, and we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior. Amen and Amen. All right. <clears throat>